About 15 years ago, my son and I had a problem. It was winter time, and uh, as normally in winter time, we sometimes in Kansas get a little bit of snow. And we were excited about that. My son was really excited about that to go sledding in the snow. But the problem was this it was Dad and Tyler and one sled. Well, we, were, we went out, and as we were walking toward this little hill where the, where the sledding would be best, my son was thinking about the problem of two guys in one sled. And then he got an idea. He said, Dad, I've figured it out. I'm going to share the sled with you. I'll ride in the sled going downhill, and you can bring it back up. <laughs> Interesting solution to a problem. Well, uh, you know, anytime there's people, whether it's father and son or an entire church family, anytime you get people together, there's bound to be problems. There's bound to be challenges and difficulties and things which come up, and we have to figure out a way to solve those problems. We're going to be talking about the de- that today. In 2024, our theme, if you miss the sign or the banner, is Eyes on Jesus. If you're paying attention, you notice that that was already quoted to you by Brother Ted this morning from Hebrews chapter 12. That's been the theme of the entire year from Hebrews 12 to fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And that's what we've been endeavoring to do. Now, As a church, we strive, although we don't do it perfectly, no one does, but we strive to keep our eyes fixed on Him. That's the key to addressing all problems and challenges and difficulties and the struggles of life, is to keep yourself focused on Jesus. But it is easy to get distracted. It is easy to let our gaze go into places where it shouldn't and to fix our eyes on the wrong thing. In Acts chapter 6, I want you to open your Bibles to Acts chapter 6. The church had a problem. It was really a big issue. Now, <clears throat> the book of Acts, of course, tells us all about the first church and how it began there on the day of Pentecost. And boy, on, in Acts chapter 2, things are just going great guns. It, it's just phenomenal. Peter preaches this sermon. Uh, Thousands of people respond to the gospel invitation. There's growth. There's fellowship. Uh, the, the, The church has started in a powerful way. And don't you know, for people who are part of that, what it must have been like, the excitement and the enthusiasm and the joy of seeing how God was working and how Jesus was fulfilling the promise that he had made the apostles just days ago. And now they have the Holy Spirit, and and they are going out and spreading out to Jerusalem all the way to the ends of the earth. Now, that sounds great, except that there was an issue, as happens when you have lots of people together for any length of time, there's going to be issues. So we're in Acts chapter 6, and this isn't the first issue, but it's it speaks to an issue that could have been a major problem. Now, I'm going to read from Acts chapter 6, and, and I want you to read part of it too. So I'm going to bring up this next slide. I'm going to ask you to read the words in yellow, and I'll start by reading the words in, in white. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because... Their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. All right, now we may not quite understand the issue at hand here, but this is a world where there's not uh, Medicare and Medicaid and government programs to handle people who don't have income to live off of. And so widows were in a very often in that culture, a place where they could be destitute. And in the gathering of the church, as they met the needs of one another, the, the Hellenists, the Greeks, 
were noticing that their widows were being overlooked. They felt like they were second-class citizens. So they, they were being overlooked, and that's the problem. Now, there's any number of solutions to any given problem, and not every solution is the right solution. And, and a bad solution would have been for all the apostles to stop the mission that God had put them on to deal with making sure that this group of widows were served and that their needs were met. That would have been a bad solution to a problem. But thankfully, God had a better idea. The idea continues in chapter 6. And it's basically this. Choose good men to carry out the work, to handle this problem, and have the right people doing the right things. And that's a solution to a lot of problems within the church world, is having the right people doing the right things. And so this is the solution that they come to. Look at Acts chapter 6. Again, I'm going to read the white words, and I want you to read the yellow ones. You did so well last time. This passage is a little bit longer, okay? So get your reading glasses on. Look at the slide. Acts chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. Okay, so the solution is choose seven good men, men of good reputations, full of the Spirit and wise, so that the apostles could keep the main thing, the main thing. Now, d despite these issues that the church was having, the good news is that the church kept increasing. Uh, <clears throat> though problems and people change within the church, right? Over 2,000 years, the church has had its share of problems. Some of them look similar to this, but some of them look very different. But the good news is the plan and the prescription are consistent, and I'll say it again, you get the right people doing the right things to handle the problems. So we look at the, what the result of enacting this plan was. Now we're in Acts chapter 6, verses 6 through 7. You say, preacher, what are we paying you for? We're doing all the talking this morning. I promise, just one last time, Acts chapter 6, and now we're in verses 6 through 7. I'll read the white words if you'll read the yellow, and let's see the result when we do things God's way. Acts chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. These they set before the apostles. They prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God... And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So they so see three results of this solution that they had enacted. Number one, the Word of God spread. And that's a good thing. Okay? The Word of God continued to, to spread and to increase. Number two, the number of disciples grew. It wasn't just the, that the word went out to more places, it's that more people heard it and responded to it and became followers and students of Jesus. And that's a great thing as well. And the third thing is that many people obeyed Jesus. Here's the problem, and the solution is getting the right people in the right place to handle the problem. And they get the problem solved, and the result is when they do it God's way, that the word of His word spreads, the number of disciples grow, and many people come to faith in Christ. You see, church is people, and with people come problems. Um, as Steve Tandy I've often quoted him as saying, church would be easy if it weren't for people. Uh, that is true. There are people, uh, with people come problems and challenges, but God doesn't want to ignore the problems and challenges because if you ignore the problems and challenges, you ignore the people. God wants us instead to lean in 
and to overcome the obstacles and grow. And though it's been 2,000 years, the principal solution is still the same. You get the right people in the right place to solve the problem. In the New Testament, we call some of those people deacons. The word is an unusual word. We don't use it really outside of a church setting, but the word simply means a servant. We find these servants, and in fact, their job description is found in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. Now, I'm not going to read this for you, and it's not going to be on the slide except for the reference, so I'll encourage you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3 for yourself. Because that preacher, he is not perfect. He does make mistakes. Hoping my wife does not amen there. And you need to know the Word of God for yourself. 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13 reads in, as follows concerning these servants. Deacons, verse 8, are likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, and let them also be tested first, then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things." Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. You see, it sounds simple to put the right people in the right place to solve the problem, but you see, deacons can't be just anyone. Due to the nature of their work working with people, more specifically working with souls, you have to have the right kind of Christian. And, and the qualities listed in verses 8 through 13 are both positive and negative. Certain things they should be, certain things they shouldn't be. They must be dignified and sober-minded because they need to be respectable and serious about their responsibility. They should be tested and blameless. Now, that doesn't mean perfect but it does mean they have a good reputation. They shouldn't be a rookie Christian. Uh, they need to be a family leader. We need to see the evidence of his leader in other areas besides church. They need to be responsible and reliable, not the kind of men you have to micromanage, but men who are reliable. Our elders just say the word and the problem's handled. They, they serve well, and they're responsible to take care of things, and you don't give it a second thought. They need to have respectable wives because they're going to be talking about sensitive matters and issues concerning people, and that needs to be handled carefully among husband and wife. And so, therefore, they should not be double-tongued. They're going to have privileged information sometimes or sensitive information they should not be ad addicted to much wine because they need to have self-control. And they should not be greedy for dishonest gain because a lot of times the decisions that they make will involve stewarding other people's money. All right, so those qualifications all lead to the charge in verse 13 for those who serve well as deacons. And that's kind of the thing I want to think about for our deacons, but really for all of us. Because it's one thing to serve, but it's quite another thing to serve well. I'm not saying necessarily here at Northside, but in the religious world, some people get the title deacon applied to them like, I'm Deacon Jones, uh, hello. And it's a sort of a, an elevation of myself. It's a pride issue. They really give no thought or concern uh, to the problem that they're solving, but rather their position in the church. And that's just not a biblical approach. You should serve well with love and humility. Now, now it does occur to me that it's the, the, the charges serve well. Why make all this fuss over a volunteer position? Well, because if we think about it one way, you put the wrong man or his wife in such a position, they can do a great deal of harm. 
And I've seen firsthand churches come undone because of the wrong person in the wrong position. And they didn't pay attention to the teaching of Scripture. But the right man in the right position will serve well. He will make our elders work a joy and not a burden. And he will do a great deal of good for the Northside family. So today, speaking of the Northside family, it's a special day for this family. As we appoint new deacons, as we acknowledge those who are serving and those who have served and those who will serve. Now you need to know that the Bible gives much direction on what to look for, what qualities to look for within a deacon or a servant. But the Bible gives zero, absolutely zero direction on how to select and appoint them. We, we see kind of one example, though that's not specifically deacons in Acts chapter 6. But we really don't have any idea on the process, so God and the Holy Spirit leave that to each individual congregation. So at Northside, here's how we do it. Uh, we look at first at the scriptural qualifications for these men. We take that very seriously. Our elders look at the needs of the congregation and ask, what problems do we have? And then they look to put the right men in the right place to solve the problem. Now, uh, our deacons basically agree if they will serve for a period of two years, and we just reevaluate that every two years. Uh, that gives a man the opportunity to look at his own life situation, his health and family and all of that, and decide if it's in the, his best interest to continue serving. And our elders also look at, is this the right problem? Does this still need to be addressing? Uh, and both sides evaluate that together. So at Northside, we're going to talk about who the men are who serve as a deacon as part of this family. We have nine men who have agreed to serve for two more years, and we're going to ask uh, our current deacons if they will stand. I'm going to post your picture, men, if you'll, you and your wife will stand up so we can know who you are if we don't. Um, so first up is Bob Arrow and his wife, Rhonda. I believe Bob's right back there. Bob, Bob handles uh, all things pertaining to our facilities and as you heard from uh, our elder, Jim Weathers, uh, there's a lot of things to be managed when it comes to the facility. So, Bob, come on forward. Uh, next up is Jeff Garrison and his wife, Margaret. Uh, they handle the administration and oversight of our small groups ministry. Uh, and Jeff does a good job. He's good with people and good at leading groups, and small groups is doing well. So, Jeff, come on forward. Next up is Paul Harrington and his wife, Stacy. Uh, they oversee our family camp ministry and doing a great job with that. It's a big part. If you're not aware what family camp is, you need to become aware. A Memorial Day weekend, uh, several families from Northside uh, meet out at Rock Springs Ranch uh, for fellowship and growth and connection with one another. If Northside feels like a big church, you feel like it's too big, you definitely need to go to family camp. It's a good way to get to know. Paul's doing a great job. Come on forward, Paul. Next up is uh, Joe Holmes and his wife, Carol. Joe is, uh, oversees our small accounts payable, uh, all, all the things, all the checks that need to be written, all the people that need to be reimbursed. That is a high trust position. Joe's done it for a while, and he does a great job at it. Joe, come on forward to the front row. Next up is Drew Lowry uh, and his wife Ruth. Uh, Drew oversees Wichita Work Camp, a, a giant uh, service project within the Wichita community. Some people say, if, if your church left your community with the community notice, I would say North State says absolutely yes. And one of the big reasons is because of the work from Wichita Work Camp. So Drew, come on forward and thank you for the good work that you are and have been doing. Uh, next up is Sean Litton and his wife Sandy. He handles the accounting for Know Your Bible. Sean's out of town this weekend, um, but Sean's been, I uh, believe, doing it almost since the very beginning, handling the books and the accounting, make sure we're good stewards of the funds for the Know Your Bible ministry. 
Uh, next up is James Pierman and his wife, Julie. Uh, James oversees the Northside Watchers. He watches the Watchers, make sure that we are secure and safe. They think through worst-case scenarios for the body here at Northside and put plans together to make sure we are prepared as best we can be. So, James, come on forward. Thank you for your good work. Next up is Greg Sandlin, and Greg Sandlin is heading up the finance ministry. He's been doing that for a long time. Uh, making sure that your donations and all of the, the money and funds which you contribute gets to the right areas, gets to the right uh, deacons and ministry leaders, and he makes sure that we are being good stewards of the funds entrusted to us. So, Greg, thank you, and come on forward. And then uh, next up is Tony Weber. Uh, Tony heads up the Greeters Ministry. Uh, he and his wife, Kristen, uh, have been doing that faithfully. Tony is also out of town this weekend, and so, but we appreciate uh, the good work that he does with that ministry. Okay, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, good. Okay, uh, we want to commend all of you who are currently serving in whatever capacity you are serving, and we appreciate the good work that you do, the faithfulness with, with, with which you do it, and the excellence that you bring to the ministry. We charge you to continue to be good stewards of the ministries that the elders have entrusted to you. May they be better because of your influence and impact on those ministries. Well done, good and faithful servants. Now, most of you are aware, earlier this year, one of our deacons decided to step away as deacon, uh, and it's a, a big ministry, and that would be Mike Yulman and his wife, Stacy. Mike Yulman is head, heading up the member care ministry, and that ministry is huge and requires an incredible, incredible level of faithfulness, sensitivity, has to be the right heart and the right person. And he has led that, because it's such a big job, he has led that as a team effort, uh, working also with Randy Short. So Mike and Randy have been working this together. Uh, we appreciate Mike and Randy's faithful uh, service over 10 years to the Northside family. And at this time, we're going to ask Brother El uh, Elder uh, Doug Wagner to come up and share a few words over Mike and Randy's work. The great joys of serving as an elder is to do this sort of thing, to recognize uh, significant and faithful service. Uh, some of my comments may, may uh, copy what Toby has said, but, uh, but I'll, keep, I'll keep according to my uh, script. Member care is a separate budget item uh, to cover uh, the short-term financial needs, primarily of Northside members, but we also respond to community financial needs. Uh, in those cases with Northsiders, we also work with them to identify and resolve uh, some situations in their lives that may have caused their financial shortfall. Throughout the years, Northside has had a number of good servants in this labor-intensive, sensitive ministry, Bob and Rhonda, Bob and Rhonda Arrow, uh, took a stent in member care. Justin and Cindy Abraham followed them. Uh, Karen and I also served in this area. Member care requires uh, certain character attributes. Selfless availability, often with very short notice in un, um, let's see, not handy to what you might have otherwise had planned for your day. Wisdom and discretion in dealing with difficult circumstances. Sensitivity and good grace in dealing with Northsiders and with folks in our community. All of these covered with excellent financial stewardship. This morning I want to make sure that we give appropriate credit and appreciation to Mike and Stacy Yeoman to Randy and Kanita Short for their leadership in this ministry until just a few months ago. Please join me in thanking them for that service.
want to add a couple of comments to what Toby has mentioned uh, and make sure that Randy gets some credit here for advice that he gave to a young elder. You ever known an elder to hover over a work that you thought you were doing well? Goes back about 10 years. Randy and I suspect Mike was upset with me. They hadn't yet clearly communicated to me, which is to say they hadn't got through my thick head. Randy and I were on a chore and we're out and about and there's tension in the car because I'm not listening. He keeps talking and it's not getting anywhere. And I said, what is your problem? And he said, stop it. We've got this. Go shepherd something. <laughs> to, uh, I, I probably shouldn't tell Matt and Adam that story just yet, but um, good advice from a good friend uh, to, uh, to a junior elder at that time. I don't know if the preacher can use that line or not, but that's a, that's, that's a good one. <laughs> To all of you, uh, both current and former, thank you for the work that you have done, and we say to you, well done, faithful servants. Um, member care is a big deal. It's a big part, and most of us don't know it because it's handled so well, and it's handled behind the scenes and with great discretion and privacy, um, but it's something that needs to continue for sure. In Mike and <clears throat> Randy's place, uh, the elders have decided they definitely want to uh, appoint a new uh, Northside deacon. Uh, he has agreed to step up and will begin his service as, a de as deacon today. I'll introduce a man who probably needs no introduction. Uh, that is Matt Babish and his wife Kimberly. And Matt and Kimberly have agreed um, to help and serve in this position. And Babishes have served at Northside for 18 years years, and they have two children, Cooper and Kate. And so at this time, I'll ask uh, Matt and Kimberly, where are you? Am I missing you? There we are. There's Matt, and there's Kimberly. And so thank you for being ag agreeing to serve in this capacity. We appreciate you. And at this time, we'll ask Matt to come, come down front and uh, stand there on the second step. Matt will also be uh, taking the same approach of his predecessor and leading a team for this ministry, which is a good sign of wisdom. Uh, Babishes will be working with, uh, uh, Matt will be working together with uh, Adam Melindy, and uh, Matt and Adam will be working this together and serving. Uh, Adam, where are you, bud? I know he's there. There he is. And Matt and Adam will be uh, working in this capacity for member care and serving together. Uh, benevolence, benevolence member care is certainly an important ministry, and those who lead it must have wisdom, discretion, and be able to be trusted with very sensitive matters. So, Matt, uh, we appreciate your willingness to serve. We appreciate your heart and your family. Uh, Matt, having shown the qualities, uh, biblically speaking, of a deacon, our elders entrust you to serve this family as a deacon, as a servant. And we thank you for your willingness to serve, uh, to help make our family better in every way. I charge you to serve well in this capacity. And I'll ask your fellow deacons to stand at this time. Come forward and join Matt on the second step. We charge all of our deacons who are standing before you, minus two who are out of town, uh, we charge all of you to live out the qualities which the Apostle Paul described in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, we pray that you will be good stewards of the ministries entrusted to you, and we charge you to serve well. At this time, one of our elders, another one of our elders, Brother Craig Greenwood, will come to pray over you all. Would you pray with me, please? Our Father in heaven, holy is your name in all the earth. As believers in Jesus Christ, all of us are servants in your kingdom. Jesus gave us the ultimate example of being a servant to others. 
May each of us continue to see new opportunities to serve you as we mature in our walk of faith. From the words of Jesus, we know we show our love to you, Father, by obeying your commands. Your word teaches us to name elders and deacons in a body of believers. Today, we ask your blessings on Northside as we seek to do your will. May you bless the works of service that each one of these deacons and their wives have been involved in these past few years. May these men continue to be steadfast in their service in the years to come. May the young men hearing these words today set their hearts to desire to serve you someday in a similar way. Today, we especially ask your blessing on Matt Babish, his wife Kim, and their children, Cooper and Kate. We know a family makes sacrifices at times as they see a husband, a dad, serve a congregation. Bless them with patience and understanding. We also pray a blessing for Adam Melindy, his wife Jennifer, and their daughter Morgan, as Adam assists Matt in the special work of benevolence. Northside is blessed with many members and we desire to do your will as we continue to take care of our own first and then the community as we have the ability to do so. Father, thank you for your church and the gift of being the bride of Christ. Please watch over each of these men and help them maintain good hearts. May their service plant seeds of good news to sprout in the hearts of those who do not know you, do not know you yet. Please bless these men and their families. This is our humble prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may all, you may all be seated. Whenever there's a problem, uh, be it just two people or hundreds of people, the answer is always the same. You need the right man in the right place to solve the problem. Uh, this is true in the New Testament church and that we read about in the Bible, and it's also true with all of you. All of us principally, fundamentally have this problem, is that we, on our own, are not good enough that we all need, we all have the problem of sin, and we all need the forgiveness of sin, and there's only one way that happens. God solved the problem by sending the right man the right place to solve the problem, and that man was His Son, Jesus Christ. He died for you, and the invitation is yours if you aren't a follower of Jesus this morning. You can meet me down front, and we'll be happy to baptize you into Christ and begin walking with Him, modeling His example, by the way, of service. You don't always have to have a special blessing ceremony just to be a servant. Jesus was a servant in every way, and His followers are to be so as well. We're so thankful to God for sending the right man the right place to solve the problem. And we're thankful for these men who've agreed to serve with this family. If you have a spiritual need of this congregation, whether to step in Christ, just meet me down front, or you need the prayers of our shepherds, uh, at this time you can go to the back, and at each door there will be a shepherd who'd be willing to pray with you and for you and serve you however they best can. Whatever your need might be, the time to respond, either to the back or to the front, is now. Uh, please respond if you need to, as together we stand and sing. My hope is...